Welcome everyone, my name is Jeff Smith and I'm so happy to see you folks today at Oracle Cloud World. My topic is cloud native development. So just a little bit about me, uh, I do work on the database team as a product manager. I work with database tools and most of my talks, if you've seen me talk before, they're about the database tools that I, that I work with, SQL Developer, SQL CL, data modeler, Oracle REST data services. But this talk's a little bit different for me. I get to exercise some different muscles. I'm coming up a few thousand feet and I'm just talking about in general, what it would mean to do cloud native development with the database as the star of the show. So since we are here talking about databases, just a little bit about my database background, I'm old. So that means that my first version of the Oracle database started with a seven. I know some of you were saying, oh, that's nothing. I started with version two or three or four or five or six. That's all swell. Um, if you're brand new to the Oracle database or if you're brand new to running Oracle database in the cloud, it really doesn't matter the specific version of the Oracle database. Most of what I'm talking about today is generic and it would apply to any of the supported versions of Oracle in Oracle cloud. Uh, I will say, uh, in the DBA life I led, I did completely wipe out a production database. That was in 2000. Um, and I think I learned my lesson because I haven't done that since. Although to be completely honest and upfront with you, I've not been in a production role since 2001. So maybe that's why I haven't done it since. Uh, you can find me helping people online, answering questions, writing blog posts, doing up videos. If you search that Jeff Smith, that's how you're gonna find me. Uh, searching on Jeff Smith isn't very optimal, but if you add the word Oracle in there, you should find my stuff. And I might be referencing some tips and some technologies uh, from my tools, and that's a, that's a good way to find it. But for important links, I'll have a bit.ly link on the slide, and I'll pause just long enough so you can take a screen capture and follow that later. Okay, so in general, this talk's going to be about now I'm, gonna, I'm trying not to um, nag you too much, but I see a lot of our customers, their, their main concentration or their main energy when it comes to doing a migration is they're just lifting and shifting their existing database and apps into a cloud. And hopefully it's our cloud, but into a cloud. And you're really missing out on a lot of potential, a lot of just great free built-in tech that we as a cloud provider are giving to you to have a much better experience uh, of running your whole IT infrastructure. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is what does it mean to do cloud native for the database administrator or for the person that's in charge of keeping an eye on the database, how you can do that specifically in Oracle cloud infrastructure. And I want to try to share a couple of ideas or observations of what my team has done in production here at Oracle for running our own cloud services, which have our own Oracle databases in them. So if cloud native, if you've heard the term a lot of times and you kind of think you know what it means, this is the official definition from the cloud native um, foundation. And generally what I like to pull out of this, especially for the database is it's an approach to do things that utilize cloud computing so you can have scalable environments and apps and you're going to be able to take care of it. So it's not just that you're running something in the cloud. You need to utilize everything that cloud gives you so that you can make changes on the fly, so you can move stuff around public, private, hybrid and everything can be glued together and everything's running like a Swiss watch. Instead, again, I'm seeing people, it's not everyone, but it's enough, or maybe it's just the customers that I'm talking to. So don't, don't feel like I'm pointing at you directly. They're more lifting and shifting. So they've got an Oracle database running on Linux and they have Apache web server for their app tier. And they're like, okay, we're gonna go to the Oracle cloud and they're just gonna bring it exactly as is into OCI. So they set up a compute node, they put the database in it, they set up another compute node, they put Apache in there, and then they're done. So they're like, oh look, that's what we have here on-prem. Now we have it in the cloud. All we do is set up the virtual networks, the VCNs, and we should be good to go, right? 
And really, that's not really living up to the potential of what the of what our cloud or really anyone's cloud offers. So just because your code compiles in your application tier, you shouldn't ship it. Just because your database comes up and your application comes up doesn't mean that you've really architected your system uh, for a cloud environment. And I promise that's going to be the end of most of the preaching that I do today. So I'm going to be happy, Jeff, not, not mean Jeff. And if we look um, a little bit more into um, cloud, you know, DevOps comes up over and over again. And again, what's DevOps mean? And you've got this funny eight on its side or the infinity symbol or whatever you want to call that, the ribbon that eats itself. What I'm talking about today is mostly these pieces, deploy, operate, and observe. And if I'm being honest, almost all of my talk is going to be on the observe um, side of the house. So what can we do in DevOps with DevOps practices and principles to really do things cloud native when it comes to the database and everything that interacts with the database? Because again, the database doesn't live in a vacuum by itself. Everyone's favorite um, thing to say as a DBA is like, oh, it's the network's fault. Um, and sometimes it is. It is just fun to always blame the network. But the database needs to be set up in such a way that things like the network uh, make sense for a cloud environment. So you're going to have access control lists. You're going to have private endpoints. You're going to have API gateways. Um, you're going to have multiple VCNs. You're going to have fast connects, you know, all of that kind of stuff. You know, and so in many one of those pieces has a problem, a hiccup, it's going to directly impact the database. And you as the database administrator need to know that so that you can confidently blame the network or, you know, confidently say, hey, this isn't a network issue. It's the database. So just other things that might come into play, security and user management, you know, where your application user is going to be defined and controlled out of, you know, Oracle Cloud has at least two identity management cloud services that you can pull from and actually integrate into your database directly. I'll talk about that at the very end of the talk. Our application or our mid tiers, you know, where you put the web servers, your web logics, your Tomcats, or just your Java apps, you know, they need to be, you know, cared and tended to watching the JVMs, the connection pools, all of that good stuff. You've got object storage, you know, where you throw backups to, where you keep static content. And, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. And, and the database has use cases for integrating with all of these things. Um, and the nice thing is all of these things that I'm listing here, we have complete cloud services built set up for you to just use out of the box. And since we're a database company, a lot of these services are built with the database in mind. Now, obviously we have lots of cloud customers that don't use our Oracle database yet or don't use it as a primary use case. But for those customers that are using Oracle database as a primary use case in Oracle Cloud, the rest of Oracle Cloud is ready to rock and roll um, for you to go true cloud native. So for example, if you come up into your console and you actually click away from the part that says database and you come into things like developer services, a lot of these things of which are, are free are just included you know, for you so you can get better um, a better like full um, universe going. You know, we've got like a function service which can you know spin up and kick off jobs and react to things in your environment. You can kick off notifications. You have logging under the database tools. That's what my team builds. You know, we give you interfaces there to manage your JDBC connection profiles and even give you SQL worksheets so you can run query on any database in the cloud. That's all a separate topic. Um, but we also have observability and management. And this is where the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about lies. So you got the ability to collect metrics across all of the different pieces of infrastructure in your um, cloud tenancy. And with that data, you know, you can set up dashboards and alarms and email notifications. And then you can program things to kick off when these alarms fire. And so you could buy an autonomous database subscription where we've done a lot of this stuff for you. Um, you could stand up your own database on your own compute node 
and piece this together yourself and try to approximate what we've done um, for you. Even in the autonomous world, you can enhance the logging, the alarming, um, the notifications that we've done for you out of the box with your own. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a bit, but you know, every time you have like an outage or an emergency or like some sort of event, you know, when you do your triage later, you're going to break down like, oh, hey, what was that scenario we weren't thinking of? Um, and then you're going to go backfill that with, you know, the metrics, the logs, the alarms to make sure that never that never happens again. Um, one of my favorite movies um, and quotes is the Watchmen. So, you know, who watches the Watchmen? Who, who's watching your data uh, or your database? And just fun fact, I'm so uneducated that I actually Googled, hey, what's Latin word for data? And it's actually data. It's a Latin word. So jokes on Jeff. Who watches the data? You know, so what's happening with our database? Um, what's, what's being done inside of our database? What's the database's temperature? Like how busy is it? Um, what's the most popular thing that's running in the database? What's causing the most IO or CPU burn? the things that cost us money because that's how we as a cloud vendor make money. We charge you for CPU. Um, and as the database does things less and less efficiently, it's going to cause more CPU burn, which makes more money for me, but I'd rather you be a happy customer and, and save money and want to use the service more. How often are these things happening? So you need to be able to track stuff over time. So you need to be able to not only keep an eye on these events, but store them somewhere. And so you can do historical reporting. Who's doing the thing that's causing the thing to break? You know, so if you've got some sort of network denial of service attack happening, you know, where's that originating from? Or, you know, who are the uh, authenticated users in the tenancy that are using things that are causing uh, problems in the system? And, you know, at what point you want to know that these things are happening so you can react to it. And even more importantly, um, what are these things happening and where they reach a threshold when we can kick off automated responses? Like, so for example, if my web service um, is starting to get overwhelmed with activity, I could have a Terraform script set up to fire that automatically deploys two new compute nodes with my web um, servers on them and automatically add entries for them in my load balancer. And all of a sudden I go from 100% capacity to 50% um, capacity and I'm serving way more users in my system. And if I'm doing retail or anything revenue related, that's good when you got more and more users on the system. And then, you know, once the thing calms down, you can have more scripts set up to go to, to undo that. But step one, you got to start collecting and start looking at uh, this data, um, not just for your database, but we'll talk about the database. So we have a monitoring service in Oracle Cloud, and part of the monitoring service, we have the ability to explore all the metrics that are collected by default. And the cool thing is you can actually add your own on top of that. So we give you for each type of um, item or class of service or class of, I don't know what the right word of that is, but each type of thing in the Oracle Cloud has its own set of metrics that come out of the box. But we also give you APIs to grab other parts of information and store them in the monitoring service. And then once you have the metrics, you can start to build dashboards and then you can start to build um, triggering alarms and then you know say what happens when these alarms fire. So for example, um, I'll talk about the autonomous database because this is just the database that I use the most. I actually use an always free tenancy. And even as an always free subscriber, I have access to some of these things. Um, so for autonomous database, if we look at the OCI underscore autonomous underscore database namespace in the docs, you'll see there's 40 or so metrics. And so two examples that I've pulled out here, somewhat related, we've got logons aggregated over a minute, uh, the mean number of that, and then also sessions aggregated over an hour and also the mean. So the difference between a logon and a session, logons are like where a, a user actually does a database um, login and then session would be the total number of um, processes on the system handling um, the users that have logged in. And I've got here just those two metrics charted 
on the same page. And once it starts keeping an eye on this stuff, you know, you've got historical rollback and you can add all kinds of filtering and you can make really fancy um, charts here. But this is just actually the metrics explore just to have a go at stuff. So if you want to take a screenshot here, this is a bit.ly link that will get you directly to the autonomous docs that displays all 40 of those metrics. Um, but once you just like, if you just know to Google OCI uh, monitoring autonomous metrics, it'll take you directly here. Now, we're not going to give you every single piece of data that you want. It would be impossible for us to know everything that you're going to want to know. Um, the good news is we give you all the APIs necessary to add your own. So um, the way cloud works, you know, it's kind of API driven. You know, we build with the REST APIs first. So that's the core of all of the um, documentation that you'll see. And then on top of that, we'll build client command line interfaces. And then optionally, and almost always, we'll have console web panels that you can point and click. And at the end of the day, they all fire off these um, REST APIs. So... There's an endpoint called post metric data, and it expects a very specific JSON body. And then once you adhere to that, you can simply post to the metric service on this endpoint, and your additional piece of data is going to be stored in the metric service. So for example, if we didn't have um, uh, a metric um, for autonomous database that tracks something like um, alert log entries, like, hey, tell me every single time you see the text ABC in an alert log. Um, I could write some code that finds that, that puts together the JSON document and then fires off to this metric. And then it's, I can start tracking it and have alarms and notifications based off of that. The other thing I like about cloud is not only is everything API driven in the documentation, we have like these really nice complete client show me how examples. So I've been playing more with Python lately just because it's like so much easier than I ever imagined it could be. Like back in the day, I did a bunch of Perl scripting and I thought that was easy. And then I picked up Python. I was like, okay, this is a reason why this is so popular with the kids. So for almost any API call in the docs, if you go to the examples page, they're gonna have point and click places where you can literally just go get the code and then you can grab that and, and build functions for the function service to call, for example. All right. So we're going to get some data um, out of our database. We're going to do it ourselves because the custom, sorry, because the metric that we want to look for isn't being collected by the service itself. I want to put something else in there. So we're going to actually treat the database as a web client. We're going to have the database run some code that would probably almost always be with PL SQL, but inside that PL SQL, we'll have some SQL. So literally, we're going to use the database to ask the database some questions about itself, collect that data and post it up in the metric service. So I'm gonna pause here again. So I got some code on the screen. I don't really necessarily want you to read it, but there's a gist out there that my boss, Chris Rice, who's vice president and architect, who helps build a lot of this tooling, has put together to show just how easy it is to grab things out of the database and post it over to the monitoring service as a metric. And remember, since it's done with SQL and PL SQL, You've probably have been using local database for a while. These are like second native languages to you. You know how powerful they are. You can, you, like it's almost unlimited potential of things that you can store. So once you're uh, keeping track of these metrics, you probably want a human readable interface to it. You don't want, I mean, you want the automation, but you also need the, hey, there's a problem, slide up to the console, log in and, and start clicking around and drilling back and see what's happening. So. Part of the monitoring service, you can create dashboards. So this is a really plain Jane generic dashboard. I just literally took those two previous uh, metrics. I think I, I kept DB sessions, but I added logical reads, um, put them up on two different types of charts. I think there's six or eight different types of charts you can choose from. And there's a design view where you can kind of like pull and push stuff around and make charts bigger and you can add different filters. Um, and then you're going to be able to uh, go backwards in time based on how uh, long that data has been retained. But when you're in the design view, uh, you have widgets. And in the widgets, if you haven't already created one, you can create one on the fly. And those widgets are just tied to those metrics. 
in the display um, of that data. And then there's a whole slew of different types of filters you can add to the report. So for example, I don't have one database, I have a fleet of databases and I need to be able to go back and forth between them uh, through different depart or compartments and regions and whatever, you know, having these filters up top makes it a really nice experience for the admin when something's on fire to go directly to what they need to see. So my, my team service, the database tool service, we use the autonomous database as the repository for our service data. Um, and we're live in 35 regions worldwide. So that means in 35 regions, we have one autonomous database each for primary. And then we have an additional one set up for data guard standby. So if that goes down, we can flip over. We have to keep an eye on all of that stuff. So those exact same metrics are being instead fed to uh, a Grafana dashboard. Same concept as the um, monitoring service provides, it's just uh, Grafana. Um, and if you want to use Grafana too, the Grafana company does have a plugin so that you can hook up into OCI. And I will say I'm not advocating or endorsing this, and I think this is a, a charge thing. But you know, once that data is in your tenancy, you can access it lots of different ways. You can write code, you can do all kinds of cool stuff over that data. Um, and this is just an example of one of those things that you can do beyond of what's just available with click click in the cloud. Okay, so it's not enough just to see what's going on. I, I need to hear about the problems before they really become critical or when they're about to become critical. So we create alarms. And I have to tell you, I'm not a certified OCI architect. I'm a point and click and see if I can figure it out. And if I can't, then Google it. And if that doesn't work, go read the docs. I never had to let go beyond point and click, figure it out um, to do any of the setup um, for my tenancy. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if I want to create an alarm, I give it a name. I'll give it a severity level. Try to use good descriptions, good names, so when these emails come in, you know exactly what they're about. Um, you tie it to a metric, and you apply um, a threshold for when this alarm is going to fire. And the nice thing is once you define these, Oracle Cloud keeps an eye on how often the alarms have been fired, and you, you can generally get a current state of all of the alarms you have deployed at any point, even when they're not being fired. So you can make sure everything's working the way you want it to. Uh, so the trigger rule, I can actually see the current activity and say, hey, when, when X goes less or greater than or equal to Y, uh, that's when I want you to do the thing. Uh, and the thing is generally two different types of things. You can send an email or you can fire off a script. And so in my case, I just set up an email. And once you've done that, before it goes live live, you're going to get uh, an email to the email that you've set up for the notification. It's be like, hey, are you sure you want to subscribe to this? And I can say, oh, Chris, quit picking on me. I'm not in charge of that. You're in charge of that. Just never click this approve, and I won't get the alerts. But if I do subscribe, then I'm going to be up and ready to go. Closest I'll ever get to pager duty, pretty much. All right, so it's not just the database that you want to keep an eye on. It's all of the applications that are feeding off of the database. So for example, web apps. You've got a web server. You've got a load balancer, probably. You might have API gateways. You need to keep an eye on those things, too. So for example, our team is also keeping an eye on all of the HTTP status codes. So when someone's making requests, 500s in general are bad. 200s are, bad, are the best. 200s, OK, everything's working. Um, 500s, hey, something literally on the back end failed. Um, and so we're looking for spikes and in, in, in big spikes. So for example, we can see exactly when we've had denial of service attacks on our load balancer. And then we can drill into that time period, into the data, and, and try to reconstruct uh, what was happening. And you know, without the logging set up in advance, you're not going to be able to do this stuff. So my team has done a little bit more than just set up our own cloud service. We were also uh, partly responsible for uh, creating uh, maybe something you've heard of before. It's the Azure Oracle Cloud Multi-Cloud Partnership. Um, it was all over the news, but if you're brand new to it, I'll give you a quick overview. 
basically uh, Microsoft customers in the Azure cloud can hook up their applications that they love on the Microsoft side to an Oracle database in the Oracle cloud and get all of the power of an Oracle database in our cloud in their app in the Microsoft cloud. Now, normally when you hear architects talk about how they're going to have one tier of their app in one place and one tier in another place, you start to get nervous. But what we've done is we set this up in regions and data centers where we have fast connects in place. In some cases, they're as close together as two racks right beside each other with a three meter ethernet plug or whatever they're using to connect um, the networks. And we've seen the latency sub millisecond, millisecond. Uh, in some cases, the latency across region is faster than the latency from uh, one re from two different two things in the same region in the same cloud. Um, so obviously, performance is important, and you can't have a multi-cloud experience without uh, worrying about latency and, and network times. But that's not enough uh, for this to be a real transformative um, partnership. We had to go a step higher, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the other thing that we made sure was we're not going to charge you for egress and ingress of the data. Uh, you're just going to pay for using our database and you're going to pay for using your apps. We're not going to charge you for each kilobit or bit coming from one cloud in and out of the other. And um, we're going to make it easy for you to set up. So we're going to give you point, point, click screens. And we set up um, your Oracle VCNs and your Azure networks to the fast connects. And the, Here's, if you want to take a screenshot, this is what the architecture looks like so if you're a nerd. Um, I also suggest if you want to learn more about this, uh, if you Google multi-cloud Oracle Azure Chris Rice on YouTube, there's a nice 20 minute technical presentation of how exactly um, this works and how it was built. So we have some partners to take a look at this and um, the feedback was not just positive, it was like, glowing, basically to the point of, hey, this is really how multi-cloud should have been done years ago. So I'm a big fan of Ray and follow all of his stuff on Twitter. Uh, I read a lot of Holger's um, uh, white papers, really said, you know, basically similar things. Hey, this um, multi-cloud uh, experience between Oracle and Azure, it just really works and it feels natural and this is the way it should be. Um, so what... It, why are they saying these things? So I've got a, a quote here from uh, my boss and our uh, VP and, and architect behind this project. And he's explaining a little bit in this quote. So basically, one of the things that we've done is not only are we just letting the database talk to your app over in Azure across the um, fast connect or the interconnect, we're also taking all of the metrics and logs that we've just spent all of this time talking about and we're cloning or piping them over into your Azure reporting planes. So you can have a single dashboard in your Azure environment and keep an eye on not just everything in the Azure cloud, but also everything that's happening in the Oracle cloud infrastructure. So let me just give you an idea of what that looks like. So if you use something in the cloud, those things are going to generate data. The things we've been just talking about, metrics, logs, events, and that data you're gonna keep an eye on. So what we do is we automatically capture this data and move it over into Azure for you, into your subscription so you can see it. So you can use the Azure consoles, the Azure dashboards, the Azure alarms, um, like you've already set up for your things in Azure on your applications. They're also gonna be covered on the database side as well. And the other thing that we did, which I think is wicked cool, is when you are over in OCI land to take care of your Oracle Autonomous Database, we've built Azure looking screens for you with the same names and terms that you're used to um, on the Azure side. So you don't actually see an Oracle console display that looks like the Oracle cloud screens, you see Azure looking screens with Azure looking terms. 
And the way we've built this, we're going to be able to um, take the success that we've reached with Oracle Autonomous and apply it to other things that an Azure subscriber might like to use over in OCI, like our MySQL HeatWave service. So um, all of the stats we take over and onto the Azure side as an application insight. So this is literally an Azure console screen, and this is going to have data in it that's coming from OCI. And it's getting there automatically. Once you create the autonomous database, all of this stuff just starts happening automatically. The metrics that you see are the exact same metrics that you see on the Oracle side. They're just popping up into the Azure Application Insight section. Every Oracle Autonomous Database in the Oracle Cloud also gives you an Azure dashboard to keep an eye on it. And we're doing all of this for you. So as an Azure subscriber, it's as close to a seamless experience to access the power of things that we've built specifically in Oracle Cloud that stay in the Azure realm that you're familiar with. All right, so just some closing thoughts. I did not nearly cover everything of what it would mean to be cloud native for a database or even cloud native in general. I'm just trying to give you an idea of different things to think about and expand your perspective a bit. Just like when I talk to customers about implementing automated um, CI CD for their database, change management and uh, uh, nightly builds for your database code, same principle here. Don't try to implement all of this all at once. You're going to drive yourself nuts. Break it up into small chunks that are easier to have success with. Um, and then over time, you're going to get better and better. Automate as much as possible. So it's not just enough to have the alarms in the dashboards. You really need to start saying, hey, how can we script fixes and mediation tasks for these things? And finally, I like to always end on technical tips and tricks. So. Someone in a cloud native um, scheme, if you have users defined in the Oracle cloud, you can use the IAM credentials for that user to associate with database user accounts. So Oracle cloud users, Oracle database users, and I can use one to interact with the other. So here's a screenshot of SQL CL connecting to the database not providing an Oracle database username and password, but instead providing um, an OAuth token for an IAM credential. And now I'm in the database operating as that database user, but authenticated from everything that's been set up for me in the Oracle Cloud for my user account. So this is the first time I've done this talk. I really appreciate you giving me the time and the audience to deliver this to you. If you are watching this at Oracle Cloud World, look for me. I'll be on the floor doing hands-on labs, doing other presentations. If we don't meet each other in person, don't feel bad. There's thousands of people milling about. I'm really easy to find online. Here's my contact info. I really do hope you email me. If you're on the Twitter sphere with me and Elon, hey, drop me a line at that Jeff Smith. And if you want in-depth tips and tricks and how-tos, then my blog is also thatjeffsmith.com. So uh, thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your show.